Okay, so I just want to show you the order we're going to be talking about things. We're going to start with social media. We're going to talk about newsletters and websites, um, network building using Slack, and then online fundraising. So starting with social media and why you should be using social media to advocate. You can keep people engaged with you a lot easier on social media. You can drive traffic to your website, whether you are a smaller group, a chapter, an organization, a brand that has a dark sky product, whatever it is, you can drive traffic to your website from social media. You help increase trust in your organization or your group or your cause by being present on social media. And you can help reach new people who may not have heard about you in another way. You can get direct feedback <coughs> from people and help understand who your audience is so you know who you're speaking to and you can tailor all of your kind of messaging to that and build meaningful relationships with your audience and trust by humanizing your brand or your organization or your group. So how many of you are on social media? Just by a show of hands. Yeah, almost everybody. Pretty, pretty much everybody. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so one thing we forgot to mention, uh, part of the exercise earlier experiencing uh, your first exposure to light pollution um, is important for the, the whole theme of our presentation is because for a lot of people, their first exposure to get being aware to light pollution might be on social media, it might be through an online list, it might be through something that you all share through your feeds. So um, it's important that we are out there, we're on our, our social media and you know, sharing about uh, dark fan you see as much as we can. Okay, so some statistics for you. <coughs> there are 2.46 billion social network users worldwide that you could be reaching, and just in the U.S., there are 208.99 million active social network users. So what do you guys think is the most popular social network? You can just like call it out if you Facebook. Yes. Instagram? It's Facebook. Facebook has 2.2 billion monthly active users. <coughs> and some more statistics for you. The number of monthly active Twitter users worldwide as of the second quarter in 2018 was 335 million. Instagram users are expected to surpass 111 million by 2019. And in the US, more than half of Instagram's user base is between 18 to 29. So if you're trying to reach a younger audience, that may be a good place to go. So how should you be using social media to build a quality following? Get some tips. So to build a quality following, you have to be consistent with your posting. It's important so that people know what to expect from you. And do not, if you're an organization or a group or a chapter and you want to look like you're more legit and you think, oh, I need to have 100,000 followers so that I look really legitimate. Do not do that. That's really bad. And people will know that you did it because they're going to look at your following and see that you have 100,000 followers and you've got five likes on something. And it's not a meaningful, authentic following that's going to interact with you, so just don't, don't bother <laughs> doing that. Make sure that you post quality content. People are already following so many people that you need to post quality content so that they want to have you in their feed as well. And we'll talk more about what kind of content in a little while. You just have to play with trial and error as well. Play with the times that you post. You want to post when most of your followers are online, especially with the way that the algorithms are now, so that more people are seeing your posts and engaging with them. <coughs> Play with the types of posts you're doing and see what does best. Is it, is it a picture? Is it when you ask a question and you want people to reply in the comments? Is it linking them to something? Is it posting an article? Just play around and see what your followers are liking and what does the best for you. And you can also try boosting posts or running ads. It's different for everybody. And just start with a little bit and see how that works for you. So what kind of content should you be posting? The first thing you need to do is figure out what your goal is 
with social media? Is it to just interact with people? Do you want to drive people to your website? Do you want to increase awareness <coughs> about light pollution? Do you want to convert people to donate? And then once you figure that out, you can kind of figure out what kind of content you should be posting. So interactive content is important. That's content that calls for people to interact in a way that goes beyond liking or commenting something. So things like polls, surveys, Q and A's, contests, and they're a number one converter because they're calling people to do something more than just like or comment on a post. Emotional content is something you should be posting. Research shows that posts that evoke strong emotions in people are more likely to succeed on social media. They feel something when they see it, so they want to like it, share it, and add their own feedback to it, something like that. Visual content, if you're just posting a sentence or a couple of sentences, a little blurb, that doesn't grab people's attention. So it helps to put a really beautiful image with it and then that'll kind of grab their attention and then they'll read what you wrote with it. Going live at events or meetings or things like that can help people feel involved if they can't get there themselves and it helps to just build a community for people who, like people who couldn't necessarily come to this. If we're live, they would feel like they're here. Creating event pages for any type of event you're hosting, things like star parties, meetings, film screenings. You can boost these posts to get people to see them in the areas where the events are happening. You can post in the group and just get people really excited and ramped up about your events. In addition to original content, you can supplement with articles and research that are new and relevant to what you're posting about. So if you want to post some new study about light pollution and how it affects birds, then that would be a good thing to share. And user-generated content. This is something that makes people feel involved and builds a community. These are things like, show us your dark sky images and we'll share our favorites. And then people feel really involved and like you kind of did them a favor by sharing their art, their pictures. And then if you ask them to do something like share a post or donate, or do something like that, they kind of have a reciprocal obligation to do that. They're gonna be more likely to convert and donate and get more involved. So you have to know your audience. Can I just ask, ask you something? Yeah. You, you said going live. How do you do, uh, what do you mean? How do you go live? Yeah, what, how, what, do you do it with a camera like that? Or oh, you could do it right on your phone. Okay. You I would, I would recommend setting it up on a tripod that holds a cell phone because otherwise it's very shaky. Yeah. And going live can also mean, if you've seen uh, Lauren and I um, these past couple days at the conference, we're doing live updates to the IDA Facebook page and Twitter. So we're constantly posting the panels here, what this panel is about. So it gives opportunity to people who are not at home to also feel involved. And it gives people who are here um, an opportunity to kind of look back or be directed to what's happening here. So um, just being um, dynamic at your events online as well. Yes. So, so it's like going live, like you go on YouTube or Twitter or uh, Twitch or something like that and yeah. you build a community around that. Yeah, like Facebook Live, Instagram Live. But you, you can also do things like Instagram Stories mm -hmm. where you're kind of live posting <coughs> from there. Or like we said, use a hashtag <coughs> for your event and have everybody contribute and then people at home can follow along and see what everybody's perspective is on the event because different things stick out to different people and then they kind of get to see what everybody's perspective is on the event. Yeah, so it's twofold. It's uh, like physically doing videos like through the Instagram services and then also just posting the content from the, the event that you're at. Okay. Sure. How do you feel about um, some of the um, ways that you can auto post on some of these sites. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you feel that is effective for people? Because some of them, like people, will say that that's where it's coming from. Do you feel it's less um, personal in that way, or no? It, I don't do think so. It, it really it makes like the social media manager or whoever's doing social media it. Um, it helps like, <coughs> use their task as well. You can pre-set uh, posts, you can draft posts, 
and then um, have them ready to go when you know it's going to be a good time and we'll get a lot of interaction. So um, I think a lot of the times people don't pay attention to that specifically if it's been pre-posted. Um, so that's a good idea if like you're trying to do like a monthly setup for what you want to post monthly for your organization or your chapter. But it's also a good idea to just supplement it with like uh, random spur of the moment content as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you need to know who your audience is. You need to understand who they are and their behavior. What are the majority of them online? And what is their age group? What are their interests? What kind of posts do they respond to? You can get this information from analytics. And this, if you have a business profile, they'll give you a lot of information for analytics so that you can see this information when people are online and, and that type of stuff. But there are also third party apps that you can use to get a better detailed insight into who your followers are. And just try different things and repeat what works. I, I, something that I find to be really helpful is after you've been posting for a while, like take your 10 top engaged posts and just print them out and put them up on a wall and just step back and look at them and go, what do these have in common? And once you figure out what that is, keep doing that because that's what people are responding to. And don't just post content of your own. You need to engage with the followers that you already have, and that helps build relationships with those people. And then when you ask them to do something, to share, to come to an event, to post at your event, to donate, to buy your t-shirt, to whatever, they're more likely to do that because you've been interacting with them and building this relationship. And like people like to be seen. So like especially like here too, when as someone's using the hashtag or they tag us, like we try to retweet your content onto our feeds as well. As much as we can <laughs> see it over here. <laughs> okay. So now we are gonna move on to websites. And building a good website. You have to establish your presence on the web. It adds to your credibility. People are going to search for you on the web before they engage with you, donate, or get involved with your organization or your cause. And it also increases your visibility. Your website is the backbone of your digital presence and it supports every single one of your digital efforts. So think of it as like your home base. So I have some tips for you about having a good website. It needs to be easy to navigate. That is very, very important. If your website is not easy to navigate, people are just gonna leave. Um, don't, people don't wanna sit there and figure out how to use your website. And they spend more time on websites that are easy to navigate. Studies have shown that Websites that have too much clutter and give people way too many options, instead of trying to figure out what option to click on, they just leave. They choose to not make an option or click on anything. They just leave. So you need to have concise and clear navigation categories so that people can get the information quickly. And this will help reduce your bounce rate, which is, your, if you don't know, your bounce rate is um, the percentage of people that just come onto your website and leave without clicking on anything. And serial position effect. This is just something I wanted to mention if you're building a website and you've never built a website before, but it's a psychological concept that says that people pay more attention to information that is at the beginning and the end of something. So if you insert important information on your website in these sections, you're going to get a higher engagement rate. Okay, now we're talking about newsletters and email lists. And basically, if you're not developing an email list, you're an idiot. <laughs> it's, it's, inv it's invaluable. Um, you own your mailing list. Your Twitter following, your Instagram following, your Facebook following, they own that. And if that gets shut down, you had 10,000 followers, it's gone. You're at nothing. But your email list, you own that and you can take that with you anywhere that you go. Also, emails sit in someone's inbox until they're ready to read it, as opposed to you post a tweet and there's 100,000 other tweets, and in a minute, it's gone. They're not going to see it. 
So it's much better to be sitting in someone's email inbox and they'll read it when they're ready. It sits there, it's waiting for them. It also helps you interact with your audience in a personal and meaningful way. People who have given you their, they've gone out of their way to give you their email address, they want to hear from you and engage with you. You can also call people to action with your newsletter and bring them to your website and it has a much higher conversion rate to bring people to your website than any social media platform. You're not gonna have a third party changing things on you. So I don't know if you've all heard about the Facebook algorithm change and everybody's complaining that only 2% of their following is seeing their posts. That's not gonna happen because you're in charge of your email list. Nobody's gonna change the algorithm on you. And there are services like MailChimp that are free. They are very easy to use. As long as you're not sending out a huge amount of emails, then you have to pay. Um, but they're so easy to use, you can just drag and drop. You can make your emails look really nice. Even huge companies use these um, email platforms. So some tips for building a list. First thing is to add your opt-in forms to the right places on your website. The top of your sidebar, the top of every page, you should put one on your <coughs> about page and consider using a pop-up even if you think that they're annoying. You see them everywhere because they work. I've had great success having a pop-up on my blog asking people to sign up for my newsletter more than the ones on my sidebar or my about page. So just consider it, try it out, see if it works. If it's not working, take it down. You can offer bribes to persuade people to opt into your newsletter. You see this all the time. Get a 10% discount if you sign up for our newsletter. That's exactly what they're doing. I'm a sucker for those. <laughs> Um, but just ask yourself if you can offer something of value. Maybe it's an ebook or tips or a guide, uh, a stargazing guide, uh, tips to dark sky places, something like that. And you can type it up, make a little ebook, a PDF, and offer that and say, if you sign up for our newsletter, you get our exclusive content. And then people will sign up to get that content. Again, calling people to action, directing them to your website or relevant research. I've heard of a lot of newsletters that have been very successful and all they do is just direct to other websites. They just compile a bunch of articles that they're really interested in at that time. So maybe you could start a newsletter that's going to direct to relevant dark sky articles at the moment and people that want to stay up to date on dark sky research will follow that, that email list. And send out content with value, very much like social media. If you're not sending out content with value and you're sending out stuff people don't want to read, they're going to just unsubscribe from your list, and that's not good. So. All right, um, so the next topic we'll be discussing is Slack. Um, are any of you on Slack? Um, <laughs> I know there's um, an IDA advocacy Slack that a few of you might be on. Um, otherwise, lots of brands and organizations are um, trying to incorporate it into their work culture. Um, so for those of you who may not be aware, um, Slack is a cloud-based messaging app, for, and it's available for both your phone and on your computer. Uh, lots of companies and organizations use it as their main form of everyday communication. Um, it's also excellent for organizations that have a remote team um, as it allows you to build an online community. Uh, like for instance, a lot of us folks here are from different parts of the world. So if you're a chapter um, or if you're from another organization, it, uh, you might have people flying in from somewhere else. Um, if they're on Slack, they're able to stay up to date with what's going on within your organization. And I'll touch on that more in a little bit. Um, but we'll be We'll be starting by discussing on how it can be used to internally for communication and collaboration. Um, so uh, as, as we all know by being here this weekend, it's so powerful to be able to connect with your colleagues. Um, and uh, while Slack does not fall under a social media category, it is by nature a social tool. So one of the best things about Slack 
um, is how it can minimize a backlog of emails. There's always so much going on and we get slammed with emails from, you know, like uh, clothing companies we signed up for, from our friends, from our families, um, uh, newsletters. So uh, oftentimes there's, there's content that doesn't need to be posted in an email that you can send quickly in an instant message. Um, to avoid people missing out on your emails or just getting lost in your spam or your inbox. Um, so it doesn't necessarily take place of emails because sometimes you do need to send like large files or you know like urgent things. So um, it's just easier sometimes when you have a separate place where you can communicate and have a quick interaction. You can send an instant message and jump in and out of conversations. Um, it's also, Slack is also a really awesome place to create a culture for your company and your organization, um, especially if you're remote. It's a great place to have discussions as well that aren't limited to work. Um, for instance, if you're not familiar with the structure of Slack, you, uh, Slack um, has, a it has a bunch of channels, and channels are kind of like rooms, so you can have a channel for uh, talking about lighting policy, you can have a channel talking about uh, events, but you can also have channels that are talking about books, TV shows. Um, it's kind of like the internet's online office water cooler. So like any conversation you would have like in an office space, you can also have a specific <coughs> channel for that within Slack. Um, and then so uh, it also kind of just helps facilitate communication. So uh, that doesn't mean that you need to necessarily be forcing members of your organization to participate, but it's just there to create a space where it's easy to communicate and for folks to get involved and you know share ideas and concerns. That doesn't have to be so formal as sometimes emails can be formal. Um, and it kind of like also eliminates the gap. Sometimes you send an email and you don't get a response right away and you might have like an urgent, like just a quick question. It just increases the chances when you send a Slack mes message of getting a reply from like your coworker, um, from another member that you're, you've been trying to reach and they're not replying to your email. All right. So when you have a community built on Slack and you're collaborating with people on Slack, it also gives you authority. So every single one of you in this room, whether you know it or not, you're an influencer. Um, and by that I mean that you hold authority in your other social groups. So um, someone who might not be as involved within uh, dark sky advocacy or someone who might not know about light pollution, they're going to trust your views and your opinions um, because of your connection to IDA or because of your larger connection to which or whichever organization you're a part of. So um, if you share an article or a message on your social media feeds or your email or you're even just talking about it, it has a chance to be reshared 25 times more than it would have been uh, otherwise. So um, just kind of, so it's just like the word of mouth done digitally. Um, I just kind of wanted to share an anecdote. Um, so I, I work with AppBlue and we use uh, Slack very extensively. It's one of our main forms of communication. So we have our, our work channels, our workspaces, which is like for your our individual departments, but we also have some where we can talk about books that we like, where we can talk about like makeup, um, just depending on people's interests. So we also have one on science, and um, a couple weeks ago, I shared a uh, IDA statement on the artificial moon that China is going to launch, and um, for a lot of my coworkers within that space, it was the first time that they heard about light pollution. It was their first exposure, and they're like, oh, like, what is this organization? I can't believe this, this, about this moon, how does that work? So we were able to have a discussion, um, and there were so many people who got interested and they wanted to know what steps they can take. Um, they, so they trusted my information because they knew that um, I, I'm a part of IDA, so they can rely on what I'm telling them. Um, and that day, we also gained three more followers on our IDA Twitter account. So that's just like an example of like how I was able to increase someone else's knowledge in another circle. Like those, my coworkers were not part of IDA, and now they can be involved in it as well. So you guys are powerful, and use your feeds as much as you can, um, because people will come to you for for information. All right, Slack also has um, something called Slackbot. So it's kind of like your own personal assistant. <coughs> 
many of us wish we had one. Um, so it's a, it's a feature within Slack. It um, sends you push notifications, so it can come to your phone, or it can come to your laptop, your desktop, um, and it sends you reminders. So you can tell Slack bot, uh, remind me when I have to be at my 2 o'clock meeting, and it'll send you a reminder and a notification. Um, you can tell it, like, uh, you can set it up to pretty much just remind you about anything that you need throughout your day. Um, and another thing that's really awesome about Slack in general is that you can do conference calls within Slack. So Slack has its own video messaging system, but you also can use in a, sec a secondary app called Zoom. And all you do is you tell Slackbot uh, to send out the video conference link, and whoever is going to join the link, join the video call, can just click on it. So it really just makes your life easier. Um, you have to remember less tasks. It takes care of it for you. All right. Uh, now I'm just going to be moving on to online fundraising. So I'll first start about, uh, talk about fundraising via email. Um, so there's a huge benefit to fundraising on emails, and I know that's very tiny, but I'll zoom in a bit, um, and I'll explain why that screenshot's up there. Uh, but so the benefits to fundraising via emails is that you're able to get your message out to a diverse group of uh, people and fundraise at the same time. So as Lauren was talking about like the benefits of email lists, it, email lists are also important because you're able to uh, ask folks for donations to um, like if you have a certain cause um, for like you know matching gifts challenge a whole bunch of things and it builds like a true grassroots movement. Um, and that's what a lot of uh, our type of organizations in the Dark Sky Advocacy, that's what we rely on. And it's also a more efficient and less expensive way to um, fundraise than hosting an event. An, sorry, an event. Um, so the vast majority of money raised online still comes through email. Tweets and Facebook posts are often too short for you to give complete information about your campaign. Um, and they can also, you know, people are haphazardly scrolling through their feed and they can miss it a lot of times. And um, unlike on social media, you know who you are reaching out to um, as you have your email list created. So a few tools that you need to get started is basically a list of people to email. And you can register folks at events. Uh, you can have a sign-up sheet for when people come in and just grab their email and then add them to your list. You can even make a QR code. Yes. And have them scan it if they want. If you want to join the list, you can scan the QR code. Mm -hmm. It makes it really easy for people at events that may want to sign up for your email list. Um, and then all you need is a fundraising uh, platform to process your donations. And if you're like a small organization and you don't want to uh, sign up for an actual fundraising fundraising platform, you can use Facebook, which I will also be going over in a little bit. Um, and you just need a way to send emails, like Lauren mentioned, Mailchimp. Um, IDA, we use Mailchimp primarily. When you, uh, if you're signed up for email list every month, you get an email at the end of the month. That's what we're using. We're using Mailchimp to send out emails and communicate with all of you. Um, and then just setting up your email. A good fundraising email will be conversational. And, uh, it will be compelling, urgent, and it will use storytelling. Um, I know there's been a couple of panels where they really focus on how powerful storytelling can be, and that's also true when you're sending out emails and when you're fundraising. Um, and when you are making an email for uh, asking donations, it should always also be about the followers and the community, and it shouldn't be about you. Uh, granted, you're raising money for you, but it should be 